So we're in week six of our series, Outsiders, and we're going to get into a pretty pivotal part of Acts. I would say Acts chapter 10 might be the most pivotal chapter in the entire book for a lot of reasons, especially in in regards to the focus of this series, Outsiders. Um, and, And when you think about Outsiders, you think of like exclusive clubs, and you might think, you know, especially in, you know, New York City, there's several clubs, and you have to be an alumni of a certain university to even get a, a possibility of getting into this club. I know there's one club, I forgot to write down the name of it. Um, there's like a $50,000 entrance fee just to get into this club, I and mean, then you've got to pay something like nine to $10,000 a year to just stay in the club, um, and you have to meet these other requirements to even do that. So if you want to give this club tens of thousands of dollars, uh, you can do that if you meet the bar. Uh, So sometimes clubs, you have to be an alumni or you have to be at a certain socioeconomic sphere or you have to be a certain type of person. But the thing about exclusive clubs is they exclude or not everybody can get in. And it seems like, you know, the the gospel is the total opposite of that is what we're seeing in this series, Outsiders. And we're going to see it very, very clearly uh, the next three or four weeks. We're going to be in Acts chapter 10, at least three weeks, maybe four. And today we're going to meet someone who is definitely an outsider, and we're going to see the next several weeks his journey to get in. Uh, because the point of the series is that with Jesus, there are no outsiders. When it comes to access to the gospel, there are no outsiders. It's open and available to everyone and anyone. Today we're going to meet a man named Cornelius, and we're going to call him Curious Cornelius today. So we're going to meet in Acts chapter 10. We'll see him today, and then a little bit next week, and then the week after, maybe the week after that too. We'll see how long this goes. But again, I want to spend time in this chapter because it is pivotal to the book of Acts, the story of Acts, the history of the church, the story of the church, and really even how things shift really in Acts chapter 10. So what I want to do is we're going to read the first eight verses of Acts chapter 10 together. We'll read the same text next week. We'll focus on the first part of it today and the second part of it next week, the same eight verses. So today we're going to just get ourselves introduced to Cornelius, find out who he is, why he's an outsider, and he is definitely an outsider who's an outsider who's an outsider. We'll see that today. So let's jump into Acts 10 as we get started and, and introduce ourselves to this man named Cornelius. Acts 10, verse number 1. In Caesarea there lived a Roman army officer named Cornelius, who was a captain of the Italian regiment. He was a devout, God-fearing man, as was everyone in his household. He gave generously to the poor and prayed regularly to God. One afternoon, about three o'clock, he had a vision in which he saw an angel of God coming toward him. Cornelius, the angel said, Cornelius stared at him in terror. What is it, sir? He asked the angel. And the angel replied, Your prayers and gifts to the poor have been received by God as an offering. Now send some men to Joppa and summon a man named Simon Peter. He is staying with Simon, a tanner who lives near the seashore. As soon as the angel was gone, Cornelius called two of his household servants and a devout soldier, one of his personal attendants. He told them what had happened and sent them off to Joppa. So we get introduced to Curious Cornelius in Acts chapter 10. There's two main descriptions of this man that we're going to look at today. One quickly, and then the other one we're going to focus the rest of our time on. The first one is just the obvious sort of description of who he is. Uh, He's a Roman centurion. Maybe the translation you're reading from says centurion or captain of this regiment. So basically, he's sort of a captain, as you would even think of in terms of our military today, somewhere kind of in the middle. Uh, He's over about 100 men. Centurions would have about 100 men underneath their uh, command. And he's uh, in in this Italian regiment. So maybe he's Italian. We don't know. We definitely know he's not a Hebrew. He's not a Jew by birth or by tradition. So he's an outsider in this story already. He's in Caesarea, which is a Jewish part of the world at that time, but it's also for the Roman world an important port. So he's a mid-ranking official who's over 100 men at this important Roman port. So, but he's an outsider to the Jewish people around him. But we see here he's, he's a trusted man, obviously. He's respected. He's responsible. But the main thing that we see here is that it says he feared God. Now, a different, depending on what translation you're looking at, it might actually have the term God-fearer in there, which is a better translation of really describing who he is. But this idea, this description of Cornelius being a God-fearer is what makes him an outsider, an outsider, an outsider on several different levels. When it comes to Jewish tradition or religion, there are four main categories that they would see people in. One is obviously you're Jewish. But that's by birth. That's by heritage. So you're either a Jew 
or you're not. You're born one or you're not. And then, so the other obvious category are what they, they might call pagans, or maybe you've heard the term goy or ger, okay? So these are non-Jews. They are pagans in the terms of they, they observe any religion other than Judaism. It doesn't matter what religion it is or which god it is or how many gods there are. Even atheists would be a pagan. So anything other in this context than a Jew by birth, by heritage, is a pagan. But within that category are two other ones, and Cornelius is one of them. So a pagan can, as we'll see in a moment, can become somewhat Jewish. You can't be born a Jew if you're already born, um, but you can be grafted in, in in sort of a way. And those would be called proselytes. So a pagan can become a proselyte. We'll look at how that transition is sometimes tricky. It's difficult. It's maybe sometimes rare. But Cornelius is not this. He is not a full-blown convert to Judaism. He is a God-fearer, which is the fourth category. So you have a Jew, you have a pagan, you have a proselyte who's a convert to Judaism, or you have a God-fearer. So it's, it describes him pretty well. He prayed to the God of the Hebrews. He had some sort of belief in their God. He's at least curious about this monotheistic belief of the Hebrews. That's who Cornelius is. But as you can see, he doesn't fit in anywhere. He's not a Jew, obviously, but he's not really a pagan either. But he's also not a convert to Judaism. He's not a proselyte. His category, he just doesn't fit in anywhere. He is the ultimate outsider. And so we're going to take a look here for a little bit, sort of historically through the Old Testament, about kind of where he fits or what would it take for him to get to that next level of being a full-blown pros full proselyte, you know, a full-blown convert. Is that normal? Is it rare? It, it is kind of rare. It's kind of murky. There's some laws in the Old Testament that talk about how you can make that transition, but he's somewhere kind of stuck in the middle. So how, do we, how can we know more about him and what the steps are to where he might find himself in kind of an interesting situation? The thing with Judaism, historically and even now, it's not really a big convert religion. As we said, you're born a Jew or you're not born a Jew. It is very much so a cultural sort of, uh, in some terms we've even seen lately, some geographic nature to this religion, but it's very much a cultural type of religion. So it's not just anyone, like a Christian, Christianity, anyone can pray a prayer and raise a hand and say, I want to follow Jesus, and guess what? Yeah, you can do that. Judaism doesn't work that way. In fact, if you look, talk to rabbis, they're going to really tell people, please do not try to convert to Judaism because you can't do it. Like you've lived your way for so long and we live a totally different way, totally different diet, totally different way of life. There are customs that you would just could not do. So please do not. They would almost discourage proselytes in many cases. So, but he, he's kind of in the middle here. And so kind of how this transition started is when the Hebrews were about to enter the promised land in the Old Testament, God gave them the law in the wilderness, right? And in this law, he knows they're about to conquer this new land. They're about to take the land that I've promised them. They're about to enter into a land that's already possessed by other people. And so he puts in these provisions or these ideas about how to not only worship God, that's the main idea of the law, how to worship God, and then also how to interact with one another. But also there are provisions and laws and statutes in there about how to interact with the outsiders, the unbelievers, the pagans. What, what is required of them? And what if you have these pagans who become servants of yours? Do they obey the law? In some cases, they do. One of the main laws that's repeated over and over and over again is the law about the Sabbath. This was a, a law that, they, that the Jews would take very strictly, and observant Jews even now take it very strictly, very strenuously. There are so many things you cannot do on the Sabbath. There are so many rules and regulations about this. So God took this law seriously, and his people took it seriously. But what about the outsiders that might be living among them or in their camp or uh, servants that might be an outsider? God makes provisions for them or has expectations of them even for this law as well. Let's look at this example. Deuteronomy 5.14, God says it this way, But the seventh day is a Sabbath day of rest dedicated to the Lord your God. On that day, no one in your household may do any work. This includes you, your sons and daughters, your male and female servants, your oxen and donkeys and other livestock, and any foreigners living among you. All your male and female servants must rest as you do. So the people living in, God expected them to observe this law for 24 hours or 25 hours, whatever, no work being done. 
No activity being done. Everything shuts down. The whole community takes a day of rest. Even the people who don't maybe observe the other laws, there's this expectation on them from God in the law that they observe this as well. So they observe this law, even the outsiders, that everything sort of shuts down. So this is one of the allowances or expectations God might have even on an outsider early on in the giving of the law. But we do, when we get to convert converts or proselytes, we do know that there's at least one sort of mass uh, conversion story. So in the book of Esther, which is interesting, I'd encourage you to read Esther in, in light of current world events. It will, you'll be like, hmm, I've read, that seems familiar. Because the book of Esther is about a plot to annihilate the Jews. I don't know if you've heard anything recently about what's going on in the world. We're kind of doing that thing right now, aren't we? And so... The story of Esther, this plot by this high-ranking official, uh, he's going to exterminate the Jews. He's going to kill one and then kill them all. And Esther, who is a Jew, but who's now the queen of Persia by marriage, she and her cousin Mordecai hear about this plot, and they stop the plot. But the story doesn't end with the plot being stopped. There's still a couple chapters left because there's still an attack of the Persians there against the Jews later on in the spring of the next year. And so they try to attack, the Jews defend themselves, they win the battle, and the story kind of has a happily ever after ending. But in the middle of that is an interesting sort of mass conversion story, okay? So before we have, you know, the plot coming, we know it's coming, we know it's coming, and then we have the victory. In between there is a few months, and in that time period, here's what happens. Esther 8, verse 17. It says, In every province and city, wherever the king's decree arrived, the Jews rejoiced and had great celebration and declared a public festival and holiday. And many of the people of the land, not Jews, became Jews themselves, for they feared what the Jews might do to them. So now it doesn't seem like a sincere conversion. But nonetheless, it's recorded. Now, we don't know if it was legit, if God said, okay, you said you want to be my people, so now you're in. We don't know if he said, okay, this is not sincere, so you're still out. It's just like you're trying to save your skin here because you know a battle's coming. Uh, So we don't quite know all the details here. We don't know what they did to convert. But we know that that event did happen. We also know from the law that men and women who were outsiders could convert. But we know that it looked a little bit different. So when you look at the Old Testament law, specifically Deuteronomy 21, there are allowances for women who are non-Jews to become Jews. Now the main way, and the way that it's described in Deuteronomy 21, is it would be through marriage. So after a battle would happen, uh, if the people of God were successful, there's going to be dead men on both sides, right? Just, that's just how it is. And so typically in ancient warfare, and there's, a, there's at least one occasion in the Old Testament where Israel does this. They kill everything and everyone in one certain battle, maybe two, but there would always be this unique twist that God would have where he would, where he would say, well, let's spare the women and children, which is kind of still how Israel does fighting today. It's really interesting how they still keep the same sort of parameters of war, but so what God would do is he would allow, instead of like we're going to keep these people as slaves, we're going to make them family. We're going to make them part of our people. And so there's allowances, you can read it in in Deuteronomy 21, where uh, women especially could be taken in as wives of these Jewish men. Now that seems barbaric now, and that seems really weird now, but in that culture, it was like extra special good that they would do this. We're not killing them. We're not enslaving them. We're not going to pass them around like trophies. We're not going to do that. We're going to bring them in as our people through this marriage vow. Okay? And so they, there were some requirements of the men um, to be the wives. They would have to shave their head, sorry. Uh, they'd have to cut their nails. They'd have to chain, put on new clothes. And they would mourn, it says their parents, for 30 days. And then basically they have that 30-day period where they're sort of, sort of taking this transition time. And then they'll be taken in as wives of these Jewish men and become, in essence, Jews. So that was a way that women could do that to become insiders. And again, it's, it's not barbaric in ter- how we would see it with Western 21st century eyes. It was really more a provisional blessing to these women and their children. It's better than many alternatives that much of the rest of the world would put on them. And so that's how that was written into that law and really why. Men have a different uh, way of doing things. 
uh, they don't just shave their head, they actually cut off part of their body if they want to become a Jew. That's one of the requirements. That was kind of obviously the trickiest part of circumcision. That was a requirement. And this was even before the law was given, right? Abraham, way before the law, that was the physical sign of this covenant or agreement. That's why they call it, you cut a covenant. You ever heard that term? That's why, because you cut the covenant with God and blood is spilled to make an agreement between God and a man that I'm going to follow him. And um, so... By the way, Abraham did that when he was 100 years old. Yikes, right? And he, then he had to circumcise his adult son. So there you go. That's kind of a little extra, you know, PG-13 stuff there for you, but there we go. So men had to do more to prove themselves um, than women because obviously you don't want enemy infiltration. Yeah, I'm going to be a faithful Jew, and that's a plot to, like, kill from within. Uh, purity and cleanliness was a key to Judaism, but also circumcision was the key physical sign even before the law. And we see this even in the Passover before the people of God leave Egypt. They have the first Passover. The death angel is going to come and kill all the firstborn of anyone who doesn't slaughter a lamb and put the blood on the doorposts of their home. There are even allowances for outsiders in this case way before the law to partake in Passover and receive the benefits of it. But let's look at it. Exodus 12, 48 and 49. We see the requirement for that. If there are foreigners living among you who want to celebrate the Lord's Passover, let all their males be circumcised. Only then may they celebrate the Passover with you like any native-born Israelite. But no uncircumcised male may ever eat the Passover meal. This instruction applies to everyone, whether a native-born Israelite or a foreigner living among you. This is, again, for God's people only, and this is the physical way to show that commitment to that covenant between God and that man. There's no benefit without the commitment. So circumcision remained a key part of Judaism, and it would actually, as we'll see later in Acts, cause us quite a controversy, because the first century church is very much still very Jewish in how they operate. They still worship at the temple. They still look at the law as part of their guide. That's why Jesus kind of disrupts everything, because how does he fit in here? Well, he fulfilled the law. That's where Jesus fits in. But so it's very Jewish. So there's a discussion that we'll look at later on uh, about, okay, do these converts to Jesus, do they have to be circumcised? Like, do they have to fulfill this part of the covenant? Like, what's the deal? And there's a, a long discussion, debate, even a church council meeting about it that we'll get to later on. But it's still something that we see here. So Cornelius is stuck in the middle. He's not made that full commitment yet. Um, he, he's not a proselyte. He's not fully committed to the ways of Judaism, but he is a God-fearer. He is in that category. So again, a total outsider, not a natural Jew, not a converted Jew, but not a total pagan either. So what does he do? He's stuck. There's good news for him, though, and that is even in the Old Testament, the prophets talk about a time in the future where Cornelius might have a way in. This outsider might have hope after all. Let's look at this from Isaiah. Isaiah 56, uh, verses 6 through 8, is sort of the hope that Cornelius might have here. Isaiah 56, verse 6, God says, I will also bless the foreigners who commit themselves to the Lord, who serve him and love his name, who worship him and do not desecrate the Sabbath day of rest. There, it's very important for some reason to God here. And who hold fast to my covenant. I will bring them to my holy mountain of Jerusalem and will fill them with joy in my house of prayer. We sang that this morning. That was a total coincidence. I did not even realize that was in there. So there you go. Um, then catch this. I will accept their burnt offerings and sacrifices. Remember in Acts 10, the angel says to him, your offerings have been received by the Lord. So he's already seen this happen in his own life. I will accept their burnt offerings and sacrifices because my temple will be called a house of prayer for all nations. And then verse 8, for the sovereign Lord who brings back the outcast of Israel says, I will bring others too besides my people Israel. Some of this Cornelius is already experiencing, whether he realizes it's Isaiah 56 or not. He probably doesn't. Right, but it, he is. He's seeking God. He was as devout as he could be. He prayed to God. He made offerings and sacrifices that God accepted, the angel said. He was generous to God and to others. And then again, verse 8 points to an even greater future development. I will bring others too besides my people Israel. Cornelius here in Acts 10 is one of those first people. He's one of the first examples. And really, we've, we've already looked at the Ethiopian eunuch that Philip ministered to. 
earlier in Acts. He's really one of the first, but Cornelius, we get a, a larger picture, a deeper dive into that. He's one of the first to realize this shift in what God is doing, what he really had planned all along, honestly. One more scripture here, and then we'll kind of shift to a couple of other examples that Cornelius sort of reflects. Isaiah verse 11, or 11, chapter 11, verse 10. In that day, God says, the heir to David's throne will be a banner of salvation to all the world. The nations will rally to him, and the land where he lives will be a glorious place. Remember, up until this time, Judaism is very much a closed system. It's a closed society. There are ways to get in, but it's not easy. There are ways to go from outside to inside, but it's really not, most people would say, no, just stay on the outside. We're fine where we are. And so there are insiders and outsiders, but Isaiah says in that day, in a future day, the heir to David's throne, which is Jesus, is going to change everything, bring salvation to all the world, to all the nations. So what, as we see, it appears that the law pushed people out. It appeared that it was exclusive, but all along behind the scenes, under the surface, a way was being made for everyone, even a Roman, Italian, curious centurion, to go from outsider to insider. And Cornelius is living that out in some way, even though he doesn't realize it quite yet. There are two parallels in the life of Jesus I want to look at for the next few minutes to show us more about where Cornelius is and what he's probably thinking, how he's feeling, and then what, he can, what can I do? How can I go from outsider to insider? What hope do I have? One of the parallels, the first one, is an obvious one. The second one, maybe not so much, but they're both to deal with the life and ministry of Jesus. So the first parallel that we see is another Roman centurion. We don't know his name, but we know that he approaches Jesus with a problem. He approaches Jesus and says, hey, my servant at home is ill. That's all he says. He doesn't ask him to do anything yet. He just tells him, I have a servant at home who's sick. And Jesus says, well, I'll come to your home and heal your servant, which is odd. Because this centurion is an outsider. Jesus is an insider. He's not really supposed to go to an outsider's home. It would defile him. It would make him unclean. He'd be breaking Jewish law to enter the home of this Gentile, this pagan, this outsider. But he's already doing things differently, isn't he? He's already doing things that haven't been done before, that aren't really normal before. What he's doing is he's opening the door for Isaiah 11 to happen the nations to be open to the good news. And so he says, I'll go to your home and I will heal him. And the centurion says, no, no, no. So what's interesting is, right, Jesus should not go to this man's home. But this man says, no, no, I'm not worthy for you to come to my home. It's weird that he has this mindset. He says, no, I know as a man with authority that if I send the word, my, that thing will be done. If I tell a man to go, he'll go. If I tell him what to do, he'll do it. So I believe if you just say the word, he will be healed from right. You don't have to come to my home. If you say the word, he'll be healed. Look at Jesus' response in Matthew chapter 8. He says this, when Jesus heard this, he was amazed. Turning to those who were following him, he said, I tell you the truth, I haven't seen faith like this in all Israel. And I tell you this, that many Gentiles will come from all over the world, from east to west, and sit down with Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob at the feast in the kingdom of heaven. But many Israelites, those for whom the kingdom was prepared, will be thrown into outer darkness where there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. Jesus is saying clearly here, I'm opening the Isaiah 11 door for those who are on the outside to now have inside access. Jesus is changing the rules. He's writing a new script. Isaiah 11 is happening right in Jesus' life, in his presence, through his ministry. He's making a way for outsiders to become insiders. So it's an obvious parallel here to this centurion, an outsider to an outsider, centurion to centurion. But the second parallel is much more uh, interesting, I think, because it's, and it's less obvious because this is a deep insider who approaches Jesus with similar questions that Cornelius might be having in Acts chapter 10. So John chapter 3, verses 1 and 2, we meet a man named Nicodemus. And here's what we read. There was a man named Nicodemus, a Jewish religious leader who was a Pharisee. After dark one evening, he came to speak with Jesus. Rabbi, he said, we all know that God has sent you to teach us. Your miraculous signs are evidence that God is with you. Again, on the surface, Cornelius and Nicodemus could not be more different. 
We have Cornelius, who is an outsider, a Roman pagan. Even though he's a God-fearer, he's on the outside. And then we have Nicodemus in John 3, this ultimate insider. Not only is he a Jew by birth, he's a leader of the Jews. He's a Pharisee. He's one of the tippy-top religious leaders in the whole nation. And he approaches Jesus much like Cornelius has these internal thoughts going on. Just like Cornelius is curious, Nicodemus here is very curious. He approaches Jesus, and what's funny is he says, we know that you're sent by God. Well, who's we? Because certainly the Jews don't believe that, by and large. Certainly the Pharisees that he belongs to don't believe that. So who's we? Who is he talking about? Maybe there's a small pocket of his family or friends who are like, oh, maybe there's something to this, and maybe he is fulfilling things, and he's interesting, you know. But here's what, here's what I, and this is a personal thing. Let me just step out for a second and say I, there's nothing to back this up. It's just my crazy brain, okay? I think we means me. I think he's covering himself a little bit here. Yeah, we believe. You know, we, we obviously know you came from God. He doesn't want to say, you know what, I, on my own, out on a limb, taking a risk, taking a chance, putting everything out there, I believe this. I think there's a good chance that he's like on his own here. But it sounds better when you use the third person plural, right? We, we say this. Um, so he, and here's why we can think that. He came secretly at night. So this is not a, a plot, you know. If this were happening in the middle of the day, in the middle of the street, in a crowd, you know, well, we believe you're sent from God. They're going to be doing that to trap him, to hopefully say he's going to, oh, no, 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 no. You know, I'm, I'm not like a, I'm just a, you know, messenger. I'm not the son of God. So this seems different. Privately, at night, in secret, there's something to his curiosity. And here's what Jesus tells him. Verse 3, Jesus replied, I tell you the truth, unless you are born again, you cannot see the kingdom of God. Nicodemus is curious. He's thinking, I need to know more. I need to find out for myself. I've got some questions to ask this guy. I want to pick his brain. And Jesus' response to these questions are not your typical rabbi talking points. He doesn't quote the Old Testament law. He doesn't try to deflect the attention that Nicodemus is giving him. He says, you must be born again. What in the world does that mean? And that's really Nicodemus' problem. I have no idea what you're talking about. What does this mean? And he talks about the kingdom of God. Well, what is that? Isn't Israel God's kingdom? Is the Messiah going to come and bring that? Are we living in it now? Like, just he talks in these sort of shadowy ways that Nicodemus has just thrown off. So he asks more questions. He's curious. It's clearly not a setup. There's genuine curiosity where he's trying to figure out from Jesus, who are you really? What are you really all about? I'm intrigued, but I'm confused. So then later on in John 3, verse 9, Nicodemus asked this question, how are these things possible? Nicodemus asked. Jesus replied, you are a respected Jewish teacher, and yet you don't understand these things? See, what Jesus is challenging Nicodemus with here in John 3 is, you're so close. You're right there. It's like, you know, uh, but you're, you're, you're not quite there yet. What Jesus, I think, is saying here in John 3 is, Nicodemus, studying is good, but it's not good enough. Openness, curiosity is good, but it's not good enough. Morality, you're a good man. You're a well-respected teacher. It's good, but it's, it's not good enough. Because someone who's open and studying and moral, they can just be a scholar, but not really born again. Those aren't the same. Really, someone who studies and is open could be an agnostic, right? I don't know what to believe. I'm studying everything. I'm keeping an open mind. I'm curious. I don't want to commit. I don't want to nail down to this one way, because what if I'm wrong? We had a, a college professor um, that called agnostics spiritual schizophrenics because they can't commit. They're everywhere. They just don't know what to believe. They don't want to nail it down. You know, what if I'm wrong? What if this is right? What, you know, and so you, th that's not the same as belief, as born again. Jesus tells him this. And really, when it comes down to this, what he's really telling Nicodemus is even being religious is good, but it's not good enough. There's more that God has for you. What God really wants for you is something more than empty religion or endless searching. In the end, curiosity is good, but it's not good enough. For Nicodemus, it wasn't. For Cornelius, it isn't. And for anyone else, it's not. It might be right on the edge, but you're still one step away. And that might be bad news in some ways. But there's good news. Jesus goes on to tell you, okay, here's how to take that next and final step. 
He goes on to say this in John 3, which includes one of the most famous passages in all of the Bible. John 3, verse 13. Jesus says, No one has ever gone to heaven and returned, but the Son of Man has come down from heaven. And as Moses lifted up the bronze snake on a pole in the wilderness, so the Son of Man must be lifted up so that everyone who believes in him will have eternal life. You're going to hear that phrase a lot, believes in him. For this is how God loved the world. He gave his one and only Son, so that everyone who believes in him will not perish but have eternal life. God sent his Son into the world not to judge the world, but to save the world through him. There is no judgment against anyone who believes in him, but anyone who does not believe in him has already been judged for not believing in God's one and only Son." Again, Jesus is saying to Nicodemus, and I believe Cornelius is dealing with the same thing, curiosity is good. You're so close. You're right there, but you're one step away. And Jesus says here clearly what that one step is. It's going from curiosity to commitment. It's going from curiosity to conviction, to belief. He says it five times in six verses. Belief in him. Belief in him. Belief in the one and only Son of God. That's the step. That's the belief. That's the decision. That's the choice to go from curious to committed. That's, it seems like a small thing now, but for Cornelius, who's stuck in the middle, he doesn't know what to do yet. That's why, literally, as we'll look at next week, an angel has to appear to him to then send Peter to him to connect these dots. He's, all, he's so close. He's right there. Nicodemus is so close. He's right there, but he's one step away from curiosity to commitment. It's, it's no more spiritual window shopping, you know, oh, that's nice, or browsing on Amazon. It's like you've got to click that item, put it in the cart, and buy it. It's, you're one step away. It not, I'm not on the outside looking in at the window of the display. I'm going to go in and make the purchase. I'm going to go all in. I'm bought into this. Jesus preaches the gospel here in Nicodemus in John 3, months or years before he actually lives it out. He says, I came from heaven to earth. I'm going to be lifted up. If you believe in me, you have eternal life. That's the gospel. Cornelius is curious, and an angel appears to him again next week. And then Peter preaches the same gospel to him and his family, and it changes their lives. And it changes the course of the rest of the church till this day. So here's two points of application really quickly as we close. Let me ask you this. Are you curious Cornelius? Are you right there? You're so close, but you're not committed. Uh, you're, you're curious, but you haven't like, ah, I don't know yet. I haven't crossed that line. I haven't made that decision. I don't want to commit either way. You're just one step away from curious to convicted, from curious to convinced. But if you're ready for a new life and you're ready to go from the outside to the inside, the answer is that one step, and his name is Jesus. Here's the second question, the second application, and that is, if you've already made that decision, who is your curious Cornelius? Who's that person in your life that is so close? They're a good neighbor. They're a good citizen. They're a good parent. They're just a good person. But as Jesus says in Nicodemus, that's not enough. As we see and we'll see in Cornelius' life in Acts 10, he was a god fear. He was right there. He was open. He prayed even. But it wasn't enough. Who's that person that's good, but it's not good enough? Jesus says you must be born again. It's the work of the Holy Spirit. And so our task, my prayer for us this week, is to find that curious Cornelius in your life. Ask God to bring them into your life, across your path, to make it clear, and then to give you an opportunity and the courage to just share Jesus with them. It it might be a presentation like Jesus did. It might be a small, God's going to lead you specifically how he wants you to deal with those people, but he's going to bring people into your path who are right there, right on the edge, one step away, and he's going to bring them into your path for you to help get them across the finish line of faith. There are all kinds of curious Corneliuses out there. And so my hope and my prayer is that God would use each of us to help lead them that one step to start that relationship with Jesus. Let's pray. God, there are, there are people all around us who are just like Cornelius. They're good people. They're moral people. They, they, they're good neighbors. They're good friends. Maybe even they're our family, and we love them, and we know that they're moral, and they might even pray. They might even go to church sometimes, but they've not made that next step to cross that line of commitment to Jesus. They've not gone from curiosity to commitment. 
You're so close. So God, would you give us those opportunities even this week to maybe help them inch closer to that line of faith? It might just be a simple phone conversation or a text message. It might be that as we, as we just pray for them, that they come to that decision of faith. It might be they reach out to us and say, hey, I've got some questions, or I've been really curious lately. God, give those opportunities to us is my prayer. And then as they come, help us to take advantage of them, to not say, well, maybe next time, or well, I don't know if I can, or I don't have the right words. No, you've brought them across our path for a reason. You know that we can do it through the power of your Holy Spirit. It's your work anyway that you're doing, not us. We're not going to save anyone. We're just going to kind of get them closer to Jesus as we see Cornelius will in the coming weeks. Their searching can end, and their new life can begin as they start a relationship with Jesus. Lead us to them. Lead them to us, however it turns out, either way, so that we can get them to Jesus. May we be obedient and courageous and available to be part of what you're doing in the world. So many people so close. May we be the link in the chain to get them closer to and connected to Jesus. That's my prayer today. Give us those opportunities even as we leave this place today. Give us an awesome week this week and bring us back next time ready for more of you. In Jesus' name, amen.